tonight on Mock. The, the three uh, that that killed him, it was part of, of I guess, a bigger plan um, to, to take him out. I guess people on the inside would ultimately take him out, but in prison. Well, let, first of all, let me start off by saying the three men had, that have, him, have been charged, um, they're innocent until proven guilty. skeptical I just tell it like it is in this country where we're innocent until proven guilty true what is up what's going on everyone I fucking lost my tripod so Greg if you're on here give a peek in your house I'm not sure if it's there um I looked out on my car real quick that's why I was running late I apologize I got about 14 books stacked up with one on a divot like this and we're doing it old school so uh that's it I hope everyone knows having a good one I know it's uh it's a late night and uh but I just wanted to get started on this new segment but before we do guys please hit the like button please subscribe um you know leave comments talk amongst yourself I'll get back to you so as of right now guys here's what we got going on Wednesday night, and I'm going to try to bring it down to 10 p.m., but Wednesday night at 10 p.m. will be Mafia Reads. Okay. Let me get this right. Saturday, Mafia Truth interview during the day. It's going to be somewhere from in between 1, 3 p.m. If you notice on, excuse me, if you notice Saturdays during the day, um, that's like when a lot of stations are out, a lot of people are watching and stuff that when me and Giuseppe did one out there on a Saturday and then you know you let it marinate on a Sunday I just think that's good so we're gonna have Mafia Truth during the day Saturday don't forget Wednesday what we're doing now is Mafia Reads and then we are gonna start our new MMA just UFC pretty much strictly uh talking about the fights there's a big fight coming up Saturday night so Saturday nights we're gonna have an MMA segment and everything else from that is Mafia Truth. And there's going to be another Mafia Truth in there, which possibly might be Thursday. Um, we have to see. Also, guys, when there's other stuff going on, I mean, I'll be popping. If you noticed, I've been doing a lot of lives lately. And um, I'm just because uh, I used to do that with the Facebook and Instagram constantly. But now, you know, we want to rock it over here on the YouTube and um, we just really, really, really do appreciate the support. I want to welcome Emma, though, with us now, too. So this is me and Emma's uh, gig. And um, I will be back in Rhode Island after Easter Sunday. I was going to head back there today or tomorrow. But then I'm like, then I'm going to drive all the way back in on Easter Sunday. So I'll be out there Monday. And uh, yeah, I hope you all have a happy Easter and all that good stuff. Tonight, we are reading uh subscribe guys to mafia truth and ask questions Let's get the banners going so the life and times of frank barrett dc based on hundreds of fbi documents obtained by a freedom of information request as well as substantiating research wayne klingman and zach long lay out a timeless a timeline of frank the mad bomber Malaspreri's rise through the ranks of the Italian-American criminal underground and through his time controlling Milwaukee. From car bombs to the fabled Las Vegas casino skim, Bell Starry's little-known story is sure to prove a captivating one. Wayne Klingman is a longtime fan of history, both the kind they teach in school and the history they want kept hidden. Wayne lives in a 115-year-old home in Racine, Wisconsin, with his wife, Barb, four Alaskan Malmutes, and a cat that control his life. Wayne is the producer of Milwaukee Mafia, Frank Bellisteri. This is his first book. 
So this one was Wayne's first. He's had many since. And the documentary, if you heard me reading that, and we have to get on that. I had food poisoning and had to call the hop, uh, the hospital, the, the ambulance for me, and all that, all that stuff. So um, we're all healed up now, and uh, just feel rejuvenated, feel great, and um, yeah, so stuff is good. Life is good. So it's like bedtime story time. Let me kick up these. Uh, these uh, booties right here. All right. All right. Let's just give a little look in real quick. Please and thank you. You're welcome, Em. Let's have a where's. Hello, Em. Oh, sorry. I'm right there talking to me. Let's have a where's my hat TV show. Let's have a buy your own TV show. <laughs> sorry, Greg. You left me wide open there. But uh, I got you, man. I actually think yours is at Emma's house because it was so big, too. It was the green one. But I don't think Emma's noggin could rock that. And I, don't, I don't know about maybe Tuco. No, Tuco can't. What am I talking about? Um, Tuco's got a small noggin with a pig body. But um, the coolest dog in the world. Like when you're as you're petting it, he just keeps going like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. It's fucking great. But um, <laughs> um, let me see, guys. Okay, new email, new email. Um, it's easy, all capital. We're rocking with Mafia Truth Show at gmail.com. Just add show and gmail.com. I don't know if it's this incense, but my eyes are burning. Oh, hold on a second. Sorry about that. I get the Yankees up straight. Baseball season's back. All right, guys. So what we're going to do is, now this one's a short read. And um, how we're going to do this, and it, yeah, it's a very short read. But let me see something. We got the preface. Introduction. One, two, three. So that's one. Well, I can't read 50 pages tonight because you guys will be like, what? And I don't have anything even going across the uh, screen for you though, to look at, though. So we'll go to the introduction in chapter one and just go from there and just see where we're at then. And uh, remember, guys, this is a good friend of mine, Wayne Klingman. Uh, he's our first actual client. Thank you, Wayne, for Loomis Show Productions, LLC. Remember, everyone out there, if you need promotional work, actors, businesses, you need a reel. You know, what are you guys doing paying, paying a bunch of money for your newspaper ads? It's the 21st century, 2023. You know, what do you guys look at more a day? Your television screen, your cell phone screen, or a newspaper? Exactly what we're all looking at pretty much right now is our phones so you want a boring little ad in a newspaper and it's going to cost you fucking two hundred dollars uh, a week or do you want to pay less than that and get your make yourself a little cool commercial it's fun you know what i mean and get out on the web constantly because all i know depending on what business you're doing uh if you ain't putting ads up online these days you're missing out because it's the future it's here it's the present and uh that's the way it is. So uh, that's my pitch and it's cheaper. And, you know, we could even do it custom your way. Like, you know, you have an idea for like a little type of commercial type thing, anything, just reach out. And the email is mafia proof, mafia proof, mafia truth show at gmail.com. Thank you. All right. So the life and time of Frank Bellaristrieri. I know I'm saying that wrong. B a l i s t r i e r i. Frank Balistrieri. Frank Bal. Yeah, I got it. Frank Balistrieri, the last most powerful Godfather of Milwaukee, by Wayne Klingman and Zach Long. The life and times of Frank Balistrieri. Here we go.
Okay. Wayne Klingman, 2019, preface writes, As a child growing up in Wisconsin, I heard stories about the mafia, but mostly from my great uncle, who not only told stories about the mob in Milwaukee, but he also told me his young grandnephew's stories about Al Capone and his, my grand uncle, fighting in Mexico in World War I, where he was gassed as a young kid. I thought of them as just more of the crazy stories that Uncle Roy told. He would die in the 90s in 1972. I loved him and his stories. I loved him. Sorry, I loved him. And his stories are a part of why I like history so much. Our oral histories are all too soon forgotten, allowing the powers that be to change history into what they think is best. Jumping forward, we get to my wanting to do a film with Jason Love on the craziness in Milwaukee, thinking maybe something on the outlaw biker wars, maybe something on Dahmer. However, after reading the Milwaukee Mafia by Gavin Schmidt, I knew I wanted to do the film on Frank Ballesteri, if only to find out more about what was going on with the mob in Milwaukee or how big it could really be. Well, in doing this film, which you can find on Amazon, Frank turned out to be bigger than I had thought far bigger. Being me, I went for what I thought would just be a few pages from a Freedom of Information Act request. Then six weeks later, here comes 1,100 plus pages about Frank, filled with tons of information and redacted pages information. Gee, there is enough here to make a book. Introduction, Frank Bellisteri died in Milwaukee on a chilly February day in 1993. It was a death by natural causes. Two months earlier, he was in St. Mary's Hospital for colon surgery. He was 74 at the time. In many ways, it is a surprise that the Bell Stary as loved as long as he did, lived as long as he did. Perhaps if it wasn't for his connections, he would never have seen the 70s. Violence is a recurring theme in the story of Bell Stary's life. In many ways, violence punctures the narrative. Often it is what assures silence in Bell Stary's world. And just what world was that? Ballastory was a puppet master, just outside of the frame, yet controlling events that rippled out and affected not only the people of Milwaukee and the surrounding area, but ultimately the American people as a whole. For many years, Ballastory was the man in control of organized crime in Milwaukee. In the August 6, 1978 edition of the New York Times, the FBI released Frank Ballastory's name along with the names of 29 other individuals suspected of being crime leaders. That's Mafia with a capital M, the American-Italian Mafia La Cosa Nostra. If you're not from Milwaukee, you're probably wondering why you should care about the mob boss there. In popular culture, being from Milwaukee is often be treated as a joke. For those in the city, the fascination makes more sense. Balisteri had been a figure within Milwaukee for five decades during which he rose to the top and earned the nickname Mr. Big, as well as Mad Bomber. But we'll get to that in a moment. Throughout the years, Ballesteri oversaw the nightlife in the city, controlling four of the bars and holding a monopoly in jukeboxes, maintained illegal gambling operations, and among other things, was the guy robberies had to be okayed through. But again, that's local level. What about the rest of the world? For them, most have already encountered Ballesteri's presence within film and haven't even realized it. Almost three years after Ballesteri died, Martin Scorsese's Casino, 1995, was released into theaters. The film follows Robert De Niro as Sam Ace Rothstein. Ace is brought into Vegas by the Chicago outfit to oversee the operations of several casinos, which were based on the Stardust, the Fremont, and the Hacienda. The casinos are mob-owned, money disappearing out the back. When things go wrong, Ace is almost killed by car bombing. Ace was only able to survive by a miracle of chance, a manufacturing defect in his model of car. Ace is based on the life of Frank Rosenthal, who really did survive a car bomb due to a defect in the model. It is suspected that Bellisteri called for the hit. He was called the Mad Bomber, after all. And the money that poured out of those casinos went east into the pockets of crime lords to fuel their excess and future schemes. Or that was the goal. The casino skim was to come crashing down on top of them. The rise and fall of Ballesteri is a story of intriguing questions that highlights the power of violence, networking, and unrestrained greed. 
and structuring the book you have in your hands, I have decided to follow a mostly linear path. We begin where Ballesteri did and look into what we know about him before he caught the FBI's interest. This will bring us into Ballesteri's real education, the one he got from his father-in-law, Joe Aliato, head of the Milwaukee crime family from 52 to 61. We'll find that Frank was already a busy man by the time he became the boss. When we take a look at the businesses he was running at this time, Ballesteri took over the family at the end of 61 and will examine the tensions that seems to have caused. Then everything goes black and we'll explore why the FBI, our main source of information in this particular telling of Ballesteri's story, let Frank slip from the radars until 74 and his trips to Vegas. From there, we'll take a look at the Vegas skim, how the law in Milwaukee was closing in, and his violent outlashes before he went to jail. As mentioned, the primary source of information in this telling are several hundred FBI documents that chart how the borough continually failed to build a solid case against Ballesteri until the skim finally brought it all down. All dates, names, and actions described within come from those documents unless otherwise stated. Where supporting research has been used, it will be mentioned within the text. It will also be noted when information is being obtained from an informant as the calls into question the valid, sorry, validity, validity of the information unless otherwise noted to have been double checked. All right, guys, I just want to check one thing and just make a couple announcements here since we're already at the 20 minute mark. And that was the beginning of all the introduction stuff. Um, let's see. All right, cool. Okay, no, got it. It's, it's these comments too. It's just, I don't know what it is. I like hold in the screen to uh, get them, but um, you guys rock away. And uh, yeah, you guys got that email there. Subscribe. Uh, donations to the show can be made in the link in the description. And all right. So chapter one. Oh. Before we do that, because if we're going to do chapter one, because I did that, guys, and then probably then do the, uh, I'll probably do the reads because they're at nighttime. Like, um, for example, tomorrow's Thursday, so uh, I could finish this book like tomorrow. So, I mean, it's, it's not real long and um, whatnot. So, I'm just saying, though, that the solid scheduling, though, is Wednesday night mafia reads, um, Saturday during the day, mafia truth, Saturday during the night, MMA. Um, so I'm sorry, Sunday as well. Uh, would love to do um, Mafia Truth to do like since we're doing Saturday during the day, probably maybe a Sunday night. So, uh, it's still all Mafia Truth, pretty much, and stuff like that. I just want to squeeze in some MMA because and boxing because I love fighting. And, um, if you look back on this channel from 2014, we started this uh channel with uh, MMA stuff, slash Mafia stuff, and music. Uh, we started with Whitey Bulger. And then, um, you know, Black Bass was coming out. We wrote a song for him, and we were just, you know, starting a goofy YouTube show where we were only producing about four episodes a year, if that. But we got over 400 now since May. Not episodes, but, you know, pieces of content. And uh, it's just great. I didn't know how to uh, edit or even small edit back then. So my other buddy was real busy. He was married and stuff like that. So, um you know, we'd film some episodes here and then I'd have to wait for him though to have the time to actually sit down and edit it. So this way I just realized when COVID happened, I just started to learn how to do it. And um, I'll tell you what, like it's it's great because now I can just I can I can do it. You know what I mean? And my editing's not crazy, but I don't even use software, I just use the phone. But um it is what it is. So again, guys, we're reading here um the Life and Times of Frank Ballesteri by, give me one second. I hope I brought him back up from ends. Um, you know, I mean, they might be in my car, but I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to get his other books and, um, this one here, though. This one here is a beauty. 
Sorry, Wayne. Tomorrow night I'll have the other ones. But, guys, it's Buffalo Mob, Narco Saints, and the Vegas, the actual book on the Vegas skim. Uh, like an onion, the Vegas skim. If you go to Amazon, um, type in Wayne Klingman, W-A-Y-N-E, last name Klingman, C-L-I-N-G-M-A-N. And all of his books will just pop right up. And I like them. They're like nice. Like, remember, like, you know, your little kid used to get R.L. Stein goosebumps. <laughs> I like it because Wayne's books are like small, though, but they're just great stories. Some real life. So, oh, no, actually, I don't think Wayne did any fiction, actually. Um, I think it's all uh, true, um, true crime. But, um, yeah, I like his books. I like the look of them, everything, too. And for the price of them, I'm telling you guys, get on Amazon and uh, show some support. Wayne Klingman. Let's get this check before we just read chapter one. And then it's a late night tonight. And then. Uh, uh, that pissed me off. Greg's all mad about that. Sorry, thought you meant in Pittston. Much love. Good, though. You still <laughs> pissed me off. Good night. Greg, I'm breaking your balls. Calm down, buddy. You'll get your fucking hat. <laughs> oh, I love him. <laughs> oh, fucking Greg. I love you. Oh. We had a good time last night at Greg's, guys. And in the video, though, what happened was the ring light got the phone too hot. And then the fucking phone just zapped out while we were uh, live. But we got like, I think, 37, 38 minutes in though last night. Not bad. Fucking miracle. Um, <laughs> anyway, I love this. All right. <laughs> Don't make me toss the tarp down. The tarp. I know. I was like, what the fuck, dude? I walk in, there's freaking plastic on the ground. I'm like, oh, oh Corky's going to whack me out. Um, all right, chapter one, guys. Frank Peter Ballesteri was born in Milwaukee on May 27th, 1918, just before noon. He was the firstborn child of Joseph Ballesteri, 23, and Benita Bucario, 20. Both of his parents had been born in Italy, making the baby Frank a first-generation Italian-American. On paper, Joseph worked as a garbage collector. Benedetta, a housewife, together, the family lived in Milwaukee at 423 Van Buren Street. Frank would be followed by a brother, Peter, and a couple of sisters. The Ballesteri family was a large one, if not six at home. Then the extended family, which included most important figures, Uncle Big Jim Ballesteri from Kansas, a high-ranking figure in the criminal milieu there. Sorry, guys, I had, a, I had like a little brain fog right there. I usually can read good. All right. Peter Ballesteri was named after his grandfather, Frank Ballesteri. The elder Frank, who had also immigrated from Italy, got into the hauling business when he came to Milwaukee and even managed to score the contract for garbage hauling in the city. Grandpa Frank was father to seven sons, who each honored his name by giving it to their firstborn sons. So in Frank Peter Ballesteri's family, there were six other Frank Ballesteris to differentiate between. It is in this way that Frank Peter Ballesteri was not the only Frank Ballesteri to rise to place of power within the Italian-American criminal underworld. And Uncle Frank Ballesteri in San Diego was suspected of being one of the leaders of the syndicate within that city, along with Uncle Peter. Ballesteri grew up surrounded by gangsters. While Joseph Ballesteri doesn't appear often within the FBI's investigation and his son, there is plenty to suggest that he was complicit within the underworld business. The mafia's conquest and exploitation of the sanitation industry has become a well-known piece of the Cosa Nostra lore, and Joseph Ballesteri followed his father into the business. Another important figure in Frank Ballesteri's story, John Aliato. Two, was a Milwaukee Department of Streets and Sanitation employee on paper. Later, Joseph would be alleged to be fronting his son, Frank, in some of his business exploits. The FBI all but directly stating his implication. It's clear that Frank took to lessen the importance of family, both from an Italian culture standpoint and through the lens of organized crime. 
throughout the years, family was to never be far away. Indeed, he would partner with his father in running the Badger State Boxing Club and with his brother Peter would be a partner in the city-wide amusement company, oh, sorry, in the city-wide amusement company, which controlled jukeboxes and would be the name on the legal papers to let Frank run four taverns despite a city of Milwaukee ordinance that not no one can own more than two taverns within the city. Family was important, not just because it collaborated in earning money. Family was power, and again and again, it will prove to be family that enabled Frank to rise to power to become the head of the Milwaukee Syndicate. But like any growing boy in America, Frank needed a formal education, something recognized officially in parallel with the criminal training. That education was found first in Lincoln High School, from which he entered Marquette University, College of Liberal Arts in September of 1935. His studies ended in June 1938 with 98 semester hours and 135 quality points. Frank followed this by attending Marquette Law School, from which it was well known he had been a student but had never practiced law. Records at Marquette revealed to the FBI in 1958 that Frank Ballesteri was admitted as a regular student to the law school on July 5th, 1938 but that he was withdrawn due to sickness on January 18, 1939. <clears throat> he returned September 23rd, 1940, but was out again on March 26th, 1941. The records further revealed that Bellastari only received grades for the first semester's enrollment. Thus, Bellastari not only never practiced law, but the question of whether he even studied it must be raised. What was Bellisteri doing during that time, and why was he kept on the records? The answer to these questions remains unclear. However, Bellisteri was a busy man, and the close of the 1930s would set him on the path to rise from a young criminal to the head of the local syndicate. That path was set before him once, oops, once again through family. In particular, Frank Ballesteri's marriage to Antonia Eliade on November 18, 1939, by the Reverend Joseph Olmsby, joined two powerful families together, the Ballesteris and the Aliotis. More importantly than that, the marriage turned Frank into John Aliotto's son-in-law. John Aliotto was soon to be the most influential figure in Frank Ballesteri's life. FBI documents reflect little interest given to Frank Ballesteri before Special Agent James E. McCurdle put together a report on him dated January 7, 1958, in which the prime area of focus was an anti-racketeering. The report would set off an avalanche of paperwork to follow. The case moving from anti-racketeer and a conspiracy to commit murder, rip off the Welfare and Pension Plans Disclosure Act, or WPPDA, and corruption of public officials. What was began by McArdle would end up spreading over thousands of documents in the span of 25 years before Ballesteri served any real time. Beyond its importance as the foundation of the Frank Ballesteri case, what is most noteworthy in the report by McArdle is the lack of information on Ballesteri's criminal operations before the 1950s. This is first notable because, as an informant advised special agents on January 15, 1958, the Italian-American criminal organization of which Ballesteri was a part of would not accept members with a criminal record as such an individual would draw attention. With an education in law and no criminal record, Ballesteri clearly avoided attention for many years. More intriguing is the second possibly it presents. As we'll explore more in depth in the next chapter, the same informants that readily pointed to Frank Ballesteri as one of the most powerful figures in the Milwaukee Mafia were just as quick to suggest that his uncle Big Jim Ballesteri in Kansas City was where Frank found his strength and backing. While the Kansas City Ballesteri obviously was an important figure in giving Frank clout, this overlooks the importance of his father-in-law, John Eliotto. Eliotto would take over as head of the Milwaukee Mafia after the Chicago outfit had Sam Ferrara step down. Eliotto would rule from 1952 to 1961. The idea that Eliotto's role was to prepare Frank for power has been suggested from many sources that we see Frank begin business with taverns around the same time his father-in-law takes over, sorry, takes over is unsurprising. Eliotto's having a thumb in that pie already. 
whether he took power to groom his son-in-law or whether his son-in-law proved to be his most capable soldier is a question we may never know. What we do know is that the 1950s saw Bella Story's true education and he was a great A student. Yeah, and I just got an idea, guys. So if anyone's even watching or still listen, it's got to be monotonous, though, to just go be sitting there. And I'm like, nah, 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 with nothing going on, you know? So what I'm saying is, what I'll do is, in these stream yards, there's a pre-recording. Darren Cassidy, what's up, my man? Appreciate you. I love seeing those everyone come on in here. Everyone get in here. Throw some love, guys. Give me uh uh hit the like button, please, guys. Get this moving. Hit the, if you're new, hit the subscribe. Normally, we don't just sit here and read books. Uh, we do you know, we have guests, we do all that good stuff. But I was trying this new thing tonight. But I think what I'm gonna do is if this is gonna be a weekly thing. And I'll still I'll still be watching it, and me and Emily can communicate with the people when they watch it because you can set times. But what I'll do is a pre-recording instead of live, and then this way, when I'm doing it, and you know you could hear, you know I'm I'm reading it. You're, there's gonna be um, images, and like maybe of the characters that we're talking about, or like the Milwaukee sky, like just something instead of just seeing. Grrr. Like for 10 minutes, you know what I mean? So that's what we're going to do. Scotty, what's up? There he is, the legend. Scotty Stutch, guys, give him a holler. Give him a, what do you call it, subscribe. And uh, great to see him here from you, Scotty. You're up late. I know you've got probably got work in the morning. Uh, thanks for uh, checking in. We actually started late. We are going to try. Uh, yeah, Emma, I don't know if you're subscribed yet over to Scotty though, but he's he's from my uh he's from my area. Scotty, Emma's my partner in this. Like, you know, she's with me all the way. I'm off of your truth. And uh she's ever since she came on, I don't know, man, if you checked out the channel, but like now all you gotta do is go on the playlist and you know you'll have your names like John Red, Shea, Whitey, um, um the Johnny Depp trial. Like she has it all right there, so you don't have to go all over and look. And um she hooked everything up. And oh yeah, Greg, we were talking about Scotty last night. That's right. Yeah. Um, we were on for a little bit. But uh yeah, thanks for tuning in though, Scott. So yeah, guys, I think I'd rather they'll do that. Is um I think it'd be more interesting and could keep you more following it more instead of me just having my head down and reading it. You know, so it's just um and it'd be nice because with the weekly segments that we're going to do and we wanted like, you know, I want to start doing the production stuff because I do lives a lot now and I, I love them. Um, but um, it's just, uh, we got, Oh, sorry. Um, I, I love doing them. I'll kick, I'll kick them on like when I'm driving or if I'm just, you know, going out to eat here and there, I'll always go on live, but I want to start though releasing some like good, like productional stuff where, as if I am reading and doing some voiceover like narration, and then you could see some pictures just, you know, going by. I just think that it'll be, uh, it'll do the stories more justice. And granted, listen, there's um, a lot of books out there on YouTube where it's just a thumbnail image and then you just hear the voice. And that's better. I think that's better though with them. I got a microphone here and stuff like that. So I'll try to mic the voice. I hate my voice. People say they like it. So we'll rock with it. We'll see. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much the all it. And um, Greg, I'll probably see you tomorrow. Talk to you tomorrow, man. Maybe we could head out, head to a meet. Scotty, uh, what was I going to say? Um, I'm in town until going back to Emma's on Monday because there's no sense to go back to uh, town. Um, and then come right back in. I want to do the church thing with my mom and my father and all that stuff. And, um, you know. So I'll be in the Monday, buddy, and uh, hit me up. And uh, you came on pretty much like at the end of this. I was just trying something. We got on late. It's real late right now. We will, though, finish, though, this book, though, guys. But uh, I'm just tired, truthfully. And, um, again, I don't know if Scotty heard this. Let me say it one more time. Wednesday night with, like, the projection looking, though, yes, we want to do 10 p.m. Mafia Reads. Okay. Thursday night. If we still have more of the mafia reads we have to do, we could we could handle that, right? Friday night, nothing. Saturday during the day is going to be mafia truth. Is it going to be one o'clock, two o'clock, or three o'clock? It's going to be one of those times. Let me just get on it. 
the reason why I'm saying why all why all the way to three o'clock? Well, then if we do three o'clock, then it's only noon on West Coast. You understand? So uh, that's why I just want to see what I think will work better. Saturday night, UFC, MMA slash boxing talk every Saturday night. This Saturday night we have a we have, it's fight night. So I'll be doing something different around that. Possibly have a guest on this Saturday talking about who thinks going to win the fight. And then we will have fighters on. And we have a big, big, big surprise that's brewing up for you guys behind the scenes that uh, me and Emma can't wait, though, to uh, get into fruition and get it rolling. And, um, yeah. But we're Mafia Truth, Mafia um, um, Reads. You know, the Loomis show is our staple. That's where we've even Scott even said today, he's like, dude, with the Loomis show, you know, because I'm always Loomis show productions. You still type in the Loomis show, this pops up because this has been the Loomis show for fucking six years before Mafia Truth. But like, you know, we will be predominantly Mafia, but it's impossible for me to just stay on that one subject. You understand? I want to, and I'm a musician. I play piano. I've been playing my whole life. I love music. Okay. And I love fighting. I love boxing. I love. We just love fighting, you know, growing up around here. You know, me and Scotty had a conversation like the people, you know, out in New York, Boston, you know, I well, they fought out in Boston a lot, too. I'm not saying fight in New York, but yeah, like, you know, we weren't the ones going around shooting people in the head, though. But you bet your ass, though, like we street box. And that's, you know, and that's the way it was. Scotty being a hockey player, he was always fucking fighting on the ice and the fucking street. So uh, that's just, you know, that's just different, too. And then watch, I'm going to get into some, some, I'm going to get into two things to leave you though with this. I don't know if it's because like I'm starting to see a little bit clearer now or whatever, but, um, and I never said I was glorifying though, not by any means though, but I will say this and I don't even care if people disagree with this. Like if I think some monster was like, oh yeah, man, this guy was nuts, blah, 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 this and that. And, uh, but he's going and he's just extorting innocent men like who are trying to fucking earn enough money to put food on the table for his kids and his family, you know, in a big city like that. And then you got these guys coming in and saying, and then they're going to throw shit through the window and they're going to extort them and beat them up if they don't pay. Well, they say they don't hurt the public. Well, that's the public. You're making them in there. That that I hate. Number two, you're a made man now. So if someone, I thought it was punch in the face. No, like, can't even do that death sentence i think that's some pussy shit too and i did like though mickey mikey stars though said though because he's got the shiner and made a bunch of his pictures and i think someone asked him it was um his co-host rj and he said uh wow well you're a made man you know this and then he's like no i didn't kill him it was a fight yeah i respect that you know what i'm saying i respect that but I can't even imagine, like, yo, Scotty, man, this guy, this guy pushed me at the bar. We got, we got to blow his brains out. No, you fucking, you fight him. <laughs> Listen, I know it's part of the rules, but some shit is just. I guess I'm just getting, uh, you know, I guess maybe the older you get or whatever. I don't know, man. I just don't like people who fuck with people who are like working, like you know, a good working man. You're gonna go in there and you're gonna fucking extort him. I don't like that shit. You know, like leave them alone. Uh, you know, if someone's trying to live straight, good, fucking clean life, leave them the fuck alone. Simple as that. Don't drag them down to your bullshit. If you got to still figure shit out, go figure it out. But don't drag other fucking people down to your fucking shit. To, don't do that. Don't do that. But, um, yeah, guys, all right. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. But, you know, you know how Lumi does it. Scotty, we love you. Guys, you better get over there and, and subscribe to Sober Sit Down because if you like what I'm doing over here, you're going to love what Scotty's doing over there. Very motivational, Scotty, too. You know what I mean? He's in his working at Lincoln. Scotty, that freaking, uh, that was that was tight today with the Pink Floyd. Oh, I, I had no idea, pal. That one shocked me. But uh, with a little shine on, you crazy diamond with the car, with the pull up. I love Scotty's promos. His promo was like we're WWE wrestlers. I meant to say his fucking shorts, but have a great day at work today, Scotty. Happy belated birthday again. Greg, going to catch you tomorrow, my man. We'll have a good talk. Chill out. Ems, I'm going to give you a call after this. You're the best. Darren, thank you so much, guys. We're sorry for getting such a late start tonight, but like I said, we're going to be on a lot. And it's going to be a lot of different stuff. And I apologize if some of you guys don't like fighting 
or the fight game and all that. It's just um, that's fine. And if you only like the mob stuff, then tune in Friday, Saturday, and through, and then on my lives. That's all for now. Because I don't want to. Because some people like you know could reach out. Darren, what's up? Some people though could reach out, and uh, you know I'm going to tell them no just because they weren't like a member of the. You know what I mean? That, that I want to talk to on the show. All right. Good night, all. Good night, Scotty. Have a great night. Darren Cassidy, my man. You have a good one, too. And, uh, bam. All right. Got that. Guys, love you. And um, for the reads, it's called Mafia Reads. So I guess what we'll do, we'll just make the playlist Mafia Reads and uh, night. All right, Greg. Night, Scotty. Night, everyone. Love you. Good night, guys. Subscribe to Mafia Truth. Subscribe to Sober Sit Down.